We do appreciate you being here. And and certainly invite you to come back and be with us each time that you can. We have been studying the aspect of drawing near to God. And when you know, it worked uh, earlier, and now then it's not there. The Hebrew letter, as you know, is one of my favorite ones. But it shows the greatness of the Christian system over any other system of religion. But to properly understand the Hebrew letter, you have to go back and have a background of the Old Testament, uh, especially the tabernacle and the priestly ministry and service of the Old Testament. The text in Hebrews that we have been considering is from Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 22. It tells us that having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And we looked first at the tabernacle and its application as seen in the New Testament. That while the Old Testament, uh, God had a peculiar nation, that is the people of Israel, the Israelites or the Jews, it consisted, of course, of 12 tribes, one of which was the one that was chosen by God to serve as the priestly tribe. That would be the tribe of Levi. The Levites ministered to and served God in the tabernacle. Now, the Hebrew letter takes that, and especially in chapters 8 through 13, and declares that the tabernacle of the Old Testament its priestly ministry and all of the things dealing with it is a type of the ministry of Christ. And so we looked at the tabernacle and its application a few weeks ago. But then we noted that, uh, let me go on through that, that we have boldness, the Hebrew writer says, to enter into the holiest, that is, to enter into heaven itself. Uh, because the holiest represented heaven, even as the most holy pl or the holy place represented the church. But we see that man truly has access to heaven now. It is, he says, by the blood of Jesus that we have access to heaven. But he also says that it's by a new and living way. Of course, Jesus' statement in John 14 and verse 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's setting forth, I am that new and living way. And thus, where we, uh, we want to begin this morning is let us draw near to God. It is not as though we have arrived as yet but we are able to draw near to God. Well, the question then is how? Well, as so many things, there's both the human side and the divine side, and both are emphasized within the scriptures. Not only here in our text are they emphasized, but also in other passages as well. For example, in Titus 2, verses 11 and verse 12, for the grace of God, well, there's the divine side, that bringeth salvation, hath appeared unto all men, teaching us, there, here comes man's side now, that we must deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that we must live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And so we see both the divine and the human side of this salvation. We see the same principle in Ephesians 2, verses 10 through 10, or 8 through 10. When he says, for by grace are ye saved, there's the divine side. Through faith, there's man's side. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The gift of God there is the salvation. 
that comes by God's grace. So here's God's side, but man's side as well, through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. We don't earn our salvation. Even in our obedience, we do not earn our salvation. It is still a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and two good works. There's man's aspect again. Man's nature. And two good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we have God's part. Within our text he calls it by the blood of Jesus by this new and living way. And when we consider the blood of Jesus of course what? Jesus said in John 3 and verse 16 emphasizes this, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, should have everlasting life. There's that divine side, that blood of Jesus that God gave Jesus to die upon the cross so that we might be saved. It's again emphasized in Romans 5 and verse 8 that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so here is this blood of Jesus, God's part of that salvation. But we also notice man's part. Man's part is he expresses it with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts or having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so you have God's side, but now then we have man's part being presented to us as well. But what joins these two together, binds the divine and human together? It's the house of God. And that's what we find in our text, verse 21, and having a high priest over the house of God. Here's the house of God. What is that house of God? Well, we find that it is the same as that holy place that he's talking about within that temple that we studied in our first lesson. That, ho that holy place is the church and represented the church. And so when we come to 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And so what binds the, the divine and the human side together? It's the house of God. What is it? It is the church of the living God. And that's why that house or that church has been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. In Acts the 20th chapter, as Paul is speaking to the Ephesian elders, he comes in verse 28, tells them to take heed unto yourselves and all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Christ purchased the church. And when it says the church of God here, it has reference specifically to Jesus of Nazareth. He is God. And thus, a house of God which he has purchased. Who purchased it? Christ purchased the church. And so here, the church of God is referencing the church of Christ. It's one and the same. But he purchased the church with his blood. Thus, that house of God, or the church, is his body. We see this in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, that he hath put all things, God hath put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Uh, filleth all, in all. Now then, going back to our text in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, notice by a new and living way which he consecrated, consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. His flesh has reference to his body. Yet his body has reference to the church. And thus, that which is within the veil or through the veil, we have access to God where? In the church. How dare anyone say that the church is not important? We have those and have for years. Oh, well, the church isn't important. 
Well, they don't understand anything in relationship to spiritual matters then. Because the church is of utmost importance. The only way in which we can draw near to God, yes, we recognize God's part in that salvation process. We also recognize man's part in that salvation process. But that which binds them together is the church. You cannot eliminate the church and have access to God. It's an impossibility. But now then, let's go back to man's part. And let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Realizing God's part in the giving of his son to die upon the cross, his purchasing that church that binds God and man together, Let's look at man's part in particular, though. He says, first off, it is with a true heart. When we go to the Bible and start studying the Bible, we find that the heart embraces four ideas. The first is the mind or the intellect. The second deals with the will. The third deals with the emotions. And the fourth deals with the conscience. All four aspects, when you have a talk about the heart from a biblical standpoint, you're dealing with all four of them. Unless, of course, the context would demand one or the other. All four of these, thus when it says a true heart, in full assurance of faith, you're dealing with a true mind or intellect, a true will, a true emotion, a true conscience. All of them. When you're dealing with the word true, and thus a true heart, you're dealing with sincerity. How many of us are really sincere about going to heaven? I know many times we'll say, oh yes, I want to go to heaven. But is our mind set upon going to heaven? Do we have a sincere mind in going? What do we think about? What's our intellect concerned? What about our will, our volition? That's the idea of will there. Do we make decisions that based upon those decisions will go to heaven? The sincerity of those decisions that we make? the decisions that we make within our life and thus the lifestyle that we live here upon this earth really show that we want to go to heaven? What about the emotions? Well, that's usually all that's embraced many times with some individuals at least when they say, oh, I want to go to heaven. They have an emotional attachment there because they know the alternative is eternal punishment. They don't want to go there, so they have an emotion of wanting to go to heaven, but they don't really have the intellect, the will, or the conscience to go there. And all four of those aspects are necessary in order to go to heaven. And so, do we have a true heart, a heart of sincerity? Do we really want to go to heaven? Does our life demonstrate it? Does our mind illustrate? How many of us study to show ourselves approved unto God? That's a true mind, a sincere mind. Or do we think of, well, we'll think of the Bible on Sunday mornings, maybe Sunday afternoon and maybe Wednesday night, but then we go home and that Bible's never touched. We never study it. We never open it. It's just something to be decorative around the house more than anything else. That person doesn't have a mind of going to heaven. They don't have a sincere mind, sincere heart. If we make decision, well, you know, I can skip uh, Sunday afternoon worship, or I can skip Wednesday night, uh, that that person doesn't have a sincere heart as far as his will and the decisions that he makes in going to heaven. A sincere conscience. 
that our conscience is trained so that it is in accordance with God's will. So that when we violate that conscience, and conscience very simply means a, a, a knowledge within. That's the word, meaning of the word. It is that knowledge that is within us that is, has to be based upon God's word because it's been trained that way. That goes back to the mind or intellect. That says this action that I'm doing is wrong. Or this action that I'm doing is right. A true conscience, sincere conscience. And so is it that we, well, yeah, I want to go to heaven, or do we really want to go to heaven? Do we have that true heart and all that that true heart embraces? But then he says, in full assurance of faith within our text. And so it takes a true heart in full assurance of faith. The scriptures, again, present many aspects or degrees of faith. Sometimes individuals were referred to as having little faith. Others individuals were described as having great faith. Or weak faith. Or faith that is vain. Or sometimes, for example, dead faith. James 2. So you have to look and consider degrees of faith. Full assurance of faith, though. First, we have to have faith in Jesus Christ as being the Son of God. In Mark, uh, Matthew, the 16th chapter, after Jesus has asked his apostles, Whom do men say that I am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist, others Elijah or Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. That's what man says. But who do you say? You apostles say that I am. And Peter answers for the group, really, saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's full assurance of faith. Faith in Jesus Christ is God's Son. Now, how do you know that? Well, Jesus says, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed it unto you, but my Father in heaven. How did the Father in heaven reveal it unto the apostles and others that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? That would, that would cause or provoke Peter to make this confession of faith. He did it, for example, at his baptism, when after he comes up out of the water... The father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He did it on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew the 17th chapter, even though that takes place after this that Peter states, again stating of Jesus, Thou art my, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This time he adds, hear ye him. Not to hear Moses, the great lawgiver of the Old Testament, because the law of Moses was being done away with. Not to listen to Elijah, the great prophet of the Old Testament. But now then we're to listen to Christ. Why? Because his words are going to judge us. John 12, verse 48 through 50. But also the miracles which Jesus performed. God was attesting, this is my son. He is the son of the living God. How do I know that? Look at the miracles he performed. You had John the Baptist's testimony. That John was set, told, the one you see, the Spirit coming upon, he is the one. And so he, on different occasions, said, here's the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. What is he? He's the Son of God. Peter knew that. He saw those things. He witnessed them. And as a result, he had faith. Faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. In Acts the 8th chapter and verse 37, as Philip was preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch, they were going on their way and the Ethiopian said, What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip's response was, If thou believest. What is it? Full assurance of faith. If you believe with all thine heart. What is the heart? Again, look at that which we noted just a moment ago. It deals with the mind or the intellect, the will, 
or the volition, the emotions, the, the conscience. So if you believe with all of your heart, what is it? Full assurance of faith. Thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is, Christ is the Son of God. In Romans 10th chapter, verses 9 and verse 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe with thine heart that, thou, that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What's that confession? It is that confession that the Lord Jesus, a belief in thine heart, again, all four of those aspects of the heart, thou believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead. Now, do I have knowledge that God raised Jesus from the dead? Absolutely. We know that that took place. And so I can believe with full assurance of faith. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And thus I can make that confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so it is with full assurance of faith. And he says, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Notice again, it is the heart that is sprinkled on this occasion. The heart, again, those four elements, the mind or the intellect, the will, the emotions, the conscience. A heart that is sprinkled from an evil conscience. It's not in this case the body, nor is it simply the head that's going to be sprinkled from an evil conscience. And thus, this is not concerning what some at practice, sprinkling or pouring for baptism. It doesn't represent that. It's not dealing with that. It is a heart that is sprinkled, not a body that's sprinkled, but a heart that is sprinkled. And it's representing repentance. That man's heart must be changed. It must be brought to and in accordance with God's will. Jesus would tell us, I tell you, nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That's seen in verse th Luke 13, verse 3, and verse 5. He states it again in verse 5. In Acts the 17th chapter, verse 30 and 31, as, Peter, or as uh, Paul sums up this great sermon to the Athenians, that the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. It is truly as the Hebrew writer states in chapter 9 and verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience. What is that? That's dealing with the heart now. From dead works to serve the living God. You've made a change from that, those dead works to now making that decision. I'm going to serve the living God. And so there is that attitude of repentance that one takes. What is that? That's having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. We've changed from that evil way of life to living now. I'm going to live the right type of life that God wants me to live. I'm purifying my heart. There's repentance and what repentance really is all and uh, what it involves. But then he also adds, not only having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, he then adds our bodies washed with pure water. Now, we started out in the first lesson that we dealt with this, looking at the tabernacle service. And the priest, who, Levitical priest, would wear white robes to minister to God in the temple, the holy place which represents, of course, the church. Those white robes consisted of 
breeches and a coat, a girdle, and a bonnet, and they were all worn by the priest. Then the high priest would wear additional things on top of the white robes that were peculiar to his office and the work that he was going to do as high priest. And they could only draw near to God with those white robes on. There had to be a purification thus. But there's a play on words that the Hebrew writer expresses here. The, he, or the Greek words nipto and luo. The word washed, our bodies washed, is the Greek word luo. When it says our hearts sprinkled, he uses that word nipto. The word nipto is used, was used of washing some part of the body. Have you parents ever told your children, go wash your hands before you go, come to eat? Well, they would use the word nipto for that. Washing a part of the body, whether it be the face or the hands or the feet or some particular aspect of the body. That's nipto. Luo, on the other hand, when he says our bodies washed with wa uh, with pure water, he uses the word luo, and that is to bathe oneself. It dealt with washing the entirety of the body. Go take a bath <laughs> to the children. Uh, and that doesn't mean to just stand in the bathtub or sit in the bathtub without any water. You know, some kids, uh, they try and uh, push things. Uh, you know, they don't, uh, not all, especially boys, I guess, don't like to take baths. But go what? Take a bath. That's the word luo they would use to make a distinction between the two. Spiro Zodhidus writes about these two words that nipto stands in contrast with luo, to bathe. Nipto usually expresses the washing of a part of the body as the hands or the feet or the face or the eyes. On the other hand, luo, to bathe oneself, always implies not the washing of a part of the body, but the whole. And so there you see the distinction very clearly. Not a part of the body, but the whole body. Well, now then, the Hebrew writer comes along and says, Our hearts are sprinkled. There's a part of the body. Our hearts are sprinkled from an evil conscience. Our bodies, though, are washed, luo, an entire washing. The whole body with pure water. And how, the question then is, how is this washing going to be accomplished? Well, first, it is by the blood of Christ. In 1 John 1, in verse 7, John would say, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. So here is sin. We are to be cleansed from that sin. How? It's going to be by the blood of Christ. In Revelation 1 and verse 5, again, John would express, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince, literally that word is ruler, or the king of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Here is man's part of that salvation and being able to draw near to God. How is it going to be done? It's by Jesus Christ and our bodies washed with pure water. That washing is by the blood of Jesus Christ. But how do we apply the blood of Jesus Christ and what Christ did on the cross to our sins? Well, we find that in the act of baptism and being baptized in water. Acts 2 and verse 38. 
Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Ye you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Be baptized, repent. There's having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And be baptized. There's our bodies being washed in pure water. For what? For the remission or the forgiveness of our sins. There's man's part of that salvation in drawing nigh to God. And thus, in Acts 22 and verse 16, as Ananias tells a repentant Paul, Saul at the time, Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. How are you going to wash away your sins, Saul? It's in that act of baptism. Why baptism? That act of purifying our souls in obedience to the truth. 1 Peter 1, verse 20, uh, 2 and 23. It is that having our bodies washed with pure water so that we can apply the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross to our sins. And in that act of baptism, that is how we call upon the name of the Lord. Calling upon the name of the Lord is not just simply saying, Lord, Lord, I believe. It's not just saying, Lord, I'm going to, or Jesus, I'm going to accept you into my heart as my Savior. Calling on the name of the Lord is an action. That action is found in the act of baptism when we wash away our sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. And thus we find the power is not in the water itself. The power is in Christ. And that's what Peter expresses in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. The like figure. That like figure, if we go back to verse 20, is water salvation. That Noah and his family were saved by water. The like figure, wherein to even baptism doth also now save us. Notice then, as a parenthetical statement, he tells us what baptism is not that saves us as opposed to what it is. Baptism is not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not simply taking a bath from a physical standpoint to get rid of the physical dirt that is upon our physical bodies. Instead, but... It is the answer of a good conscience toward God. It is that way that we can draw near to God by the blood of Jesus Christ, by having our, wa our bodies washed in pure water, and then by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thus, here's the way in which we draw nigh to God. It is when we repent of our sins, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And as we are baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins, having our bodies washed with pure water, we draw nigh unto God. And when we draw nigh to God, then he's going to draw nigh to us. James 4 and verse 8, James says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. How are we going to cleanse our hands and purify our hearts? It's when we, in true, full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And all that then to get into the church of our Lord, which binds that divine and that human side together. That church that is purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. If you have not done that this morning, then we would encourage you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ in being baptized based upon that faith, repentance, the confession of your faith. Be baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Draw nigh to God, knowing that he will draw nigh to us, 
And in that drawing nigh to God and that obedience to the gospel, we will have our sins washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. If you've become a Christian, but you've not continued to live that type of life that God wants you to live, you need to repent of your sins. Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them. And why not come as we stand and sing this invitation song?